This is not an image by a French Impressionist that you're looking at here, but it is of the person I'll talk about mainly today. This is a painting done by John Singer Sargent, and he's visiting Monet at Giverny. So here is his painting of Monet painting while Monet's wife is sitting over here. Um, this is from the mid 1880s. They'd been friends for, for quite a while and there was a kind of a colony of Americans clustered around Monet by that time. So his, his fame came in a rush. Uh, so by the mid 1880s, he was very well established. But um, today, still, I want to talk more about the beginning of his career and a little bit more about the concept of Impressionism in general um, to get going. And just also to um, go back to something I, that in the last class I ended with, which was a portrait again of Monet now, the gardener, in his garden, in his um, rented place at Argentoy, not too far from Paris, in the 1874, actually. Um, this is a painting done by Manet, who was visiting him at that time. And here he is with his wife, Camille, and his adored son, Jean. And that was an example of um, Manet's making a foray into the Impressionist style and its very loose way of working, although it was never fully congenial with him. <clears throat> and um, his friend Bert Morriso kind of made fun of his Impressionist paintings. But that was one where Manet was visiting and outside there he is doing, um, painting just what he saw in front of him with a quick brushstroke that was the hallmark of many Impressionist works. And we know that um, somehow in this same afternoon, Monet did a picture of Manet at his easel painting him. Now that painting has disappeared, but the third man who appeared on the scene a little bit after this at all, this enterprise was underway, was Renoir. And so he did his version of what the scene that, was, that Manet had captured. And uh, so in this one, it was especially because of the, oh, I don't want to do that yet, this brushwork that we were looking at it at the end. But I want first to just look at the composition overall. When you look at this one, although it looks as if it were purely something of spontaneous observation and recording. As you look at it a little longer, there's, um, it does have qualities of being organized into a work of art. Um, <clears throat> and I was thinking of it really in terms of the composition, not the brushwork, because when you see, just notice how congenial the line of that tree is with the line of her figure and how the boy sprawls out with his legs. So that's very much a counterpart of the way her skirts flare out over here <clears throat> and right at the center. And then how there happen to be flecks of red that go all the way across the picture, even down to the little boy's shoes and the red fan. <clears throat> so Manet is not simply recording what he sees in front of him with absolute candor <clears throat> and with um, total transparency. He, he either has so instilled looking at art, which he certainly did for hours in, in the Louvre and every place else he traveled, that it, it just came to him to organize things as he did them. <clears throat> or he did organize this painting. Whereas Renoir's does look as if it's more just simply what he saw. And this will be typical of Renoir who was 
well, actually all his career, he's sort of made sure to have a, a sideline, well, main line, rather sideline, he, that he was a portrait artist. That was his main source of income. But he was much more um, human oriented. And just look how large she is then in the picture. <clears throat> and this doesn't so neatly line up. And now she has, well, interestingly, the fan has changed colors, but colors in her head in this clothes. So then again, there might be some adjustment going on. <clears throat> but so the place where at first it looks like there's no adjustment is in the painting where it's as if Renoir is being autobiographical here. He's, he's like self-revealing. I put down a brush that had a lot of paint of in it here, and then I picked it up. And then I made the brush go from there to here. And then I loaded a smaller brush with black and it flicked up over here, slightly thicker over here. Um, well, and then I put this little red outline around here. <clears throat> so there's that kind of, um, you can participate with the artist making this. But you should never think of this as being uh, slapdash. Now, the people in, in the 1870s, some of the critics in particular, like the one who wrote the review that gave the <clears throat> Impressionists their name Impressionists, saw this as sloppy, uh, unfinished, therefore an insult to the audience because not to think enough of people to, to give them something finished. But um, there is when you, um, I don't paint myself. So here I am saying something that I only know from secondhand from people telling me. Say for example, in the boy's hat here, how do you make that so that you really have a sense of that's plausibly curving forward? Well, you use a slightly thicker yellow there and a slightly lighter yellow. And then you shift the angle of the strokes, adding a little more green over here so that it seems to curve around and back and shifts it here. So those are quickly made, but the decision about where to place it and what color it is and how thick the stroke is, is something that's been learned through lots of practice. And that's the discovery that was made in as these the paintings are now old enough that they have to be cleaned, <clears throat> when they get down into the labs and in museums, they often are discovering that under what looks like um, still a, a bare pinkish canvas, um, which occurs in small places here, sometimes <clears throat> they'll take off a lot or look underneath and they'll find that there was originally a whole layer of paint that had been taken off, scrubbed off um, to start over again. So the, um, there's an effort to maintain that look of this being absolutely uh, spontaneous that's, um, it's feigned. It, the same way an actor can act as if in the throes of elation or despair where the actor can be just like, what time does this performance finish? I mean, a painter can do the same thing. But it is for that quick brush stroke that the critic singling out Monet in particular gave them that term impressionist because the impression was known as a quick first and roughly done um, artist impression of whatever he wants to do or what he has seen. However, in the way some of the impressionist artists use that, you know, not only through the technical analyses subsequently done, but from the sheer presentation of the painting itself, <clears throat> that there's more to it than that. Because this is a, a painting by Bert Morisot. This was in the second major Impressionist exhibition of, uh, it's just called the Sique mirror, like this 
P S Y C H E, like the Greek goddess, the lover of um, Cupid. And it's the name for these kind of mirrors that tilted so that you could see yourself at different angles. And so he has the kind of subject that would be more available to the women artists and not available really to the men because it's a women's lives and women's lives inside. In a situation like that, Bert Morisot would not have to have a chaperone with her. So it's an indoor scene and you can see for a way this young girl stands there looking at herself in the mirror. Mm. It would be interesting to know what she's thinking about. You can't help but wonder what she's thinking about. Is she imagining herself in a corseted, better dress? Is she pulling it back? Is she just a young teen in the kind of reverie a young teen goes in? But so she's the model and she's in a position that would be uh, one that you could maintain for quite a while. And look at the brush stroke. I mean, Barrett more so is of any era almost have the most freedom, the most casual presentation. Look how she just scrubs back and forth here, or it goes this direction, that direction. And then the upholstery, the drapery material, just little spots, spots, flex and flex on the floor. So it becomes just an accepted, especially by her, accepted way to paint. <clears throat> and she did not get as much criticism for what she did as, say, Renoir, Monet um, would, because there was greater latitude given to the women. And this was thought of as a pretty woman's subject with pretty colors. So the women weren't held to quite the same standard, which was nice for her because she was able actually to sell paintings when the men weren't getting theirs sold. But she too, when, when you're, they're examined, there are many places where she will have taken off the, the paint, repainted. Here you can see, actually, she left an idea of what she had done before, because I was going to put the angle of the arm out there. No, that wasn't quite right. Well, I'm going to take it in here. See how she changes that? So the spontaneity comes in, it seems, in the making of the painting rather than just the brushwork. And then some works of Degas, just two for, for now. <clears throat> How in the world would you put him in the category of impressionist? He would never put himself there. He called himself a realist or a naturalist. <clears throat> but this is a painting that was in that 1874 first impressionist exhibition. And how the category is quite expanded to accommodate artists like this. What does he have in common with Bert Marisot, um, with Monet and Renoir? <clears throat> it's not the brushwork. And he has still very nice, fairly crisp outline forms. You can sometimes see individual strokes, but things are well contained. But the composition is not. And that's what he does. That has that quality that these younger artists took as being what would be modern art of their day, that that has to be speed and flux. And where is speed and flux in here? Well, it's a it's a day at the races, but it's not the horses racing back here. But it is the composition, because here you have horses that are going right out of the picture. You don't get the full carriage. You have a whole empty area here. Instead of a nicely centralized or clearly um, almost geometrically balanced work, this is what we would call occult balance, balance something large and close and something um, vaster, less defined. Um, in the distance. So what Degas does, and, and um, this seems to be one of the motivations in, in all his uh, ones of dancers too, <clears throat> is that he wants motion. 
Um, and here it would be things moving and well, actually he's also showing absolutely contemporary life because he was staying with this good friend, Paul Valpinson, and they'd gone to the races and Paul and his wife here had just had a uh, baby. So here's the wet nurse because the middle, upper middle class and aristocratic women um, did not nurse their own children. They would have wet nurses from the country. And so here she's looking very solicitously with the wet nurse, as does their dog. And you see that also, this is from the mid 1880s and this pastel, so that's like, like chalk, only it's um, oilier chalk. And it's called Waiting. And it's one of his back room ballet scenes. Um, it's not known, is there a story here at all? Are these women in any way affiliated other than they are just off stage here a dancer who's perhaps just had an exercise they're one of their interminable exams and she's uh, rubbing her ankle and this woman could be her chaperone it could be also another dancer who's not you know hasn't disrobed and put on her costume yet but so here what it would be is the, the oddity of the angle, the um, pushing them up there in that uh, top corner, as if he just comes in and he looks down and he sees them there. Well, that can come from real life, but there is another source for um, all of these artists. Well, I don't know if I can say this about Manoir, Renoir, but many of the others, and that's Japanese art. Because, you know, it's a choose them. Who can start something absolutely brand new? Um, but just as Picasso will find inspiration in the art from the um, French colonies in, in Africa, <clears throat> the, um, the Impressionists are, and, and people who were not Impressionists, like some of their friends who were painters, uh, were fascinated by the, Japanese woodblock prints that started to come into Paris ever since the shop was set up in the early 1860s. Um, because uh, Japan had just been open to the West in the 1850s. So it was a very exotic culture to them. And, and they were um, fascinated by these where you see whole blank areas, forms clearly outlined in solid color, you still have the sense of them being three-dimensional figures, but um, it's a totally different way of going about it. Nothing like that in the Western tradition. So now we do young Claude Monet. Here he is not so young. Uh, it's a self-portrait of him. And his, uh, he did in the mid 1880s as they say, by which time he was a success. Um, oh, excuse me for, I had to hear if that was a call I had to take. Um, to go back to the beginning of his career, he, he was born in Paris, but uh, his father and mother moved to the um, Le Havre, the harbor, you know, where the Seine comes into the English Channel. And his father was a very successful, I guess you'd say wholesale grocer. Uh, <clears throat> Claude's mother had been a painter and she encouraged her son's interest in art, but his father did not at all. And unfortunately his mother died when he was 16. But um, Claude was hell bent on being a painter. And he was much encouraged by one person he met there in Le Havre, this um, painter, Eugene Boudin, who was one of the early artists to paint outdoors. 
Um, there's the group that did the, in Fontainebleau, and that included um, Corot. And then Boudin is working up here along the coast. He was a self-trained artist he, by the end of his career, immensely successful. Especially for doing paintings like this. Now, this is an oil painting, and he probably did it on his in his studio, but it's very small, and it just captures the new life of the middle class Parisians escaping the city, going to the coast, um, enjoying the breeze, which sometimes is considerable, as you can see from the flags here, and from the waves. And this is a fishing boat, you see, I mean, swimming. And this is where you're going to change your bathing costume and someone getting in here. And he did countless paintings like this, based generally um, initially on sketches he did on site. And on the back of them, he would write uh, the time of day and what the weather conditions were. Um, he becomes known as the painter of skies in particular, but he worked very quickly and he just captured these scenes and because they were small and because they become like uh, souvenirs of people's vacations. And so they lap them up or of the scenes along the coast that they might've seen. So tourism is it really has an impact on his career. But that would be a, a painting he did. And this is something he would have done on site. Now he could have used oil paints because by the 1860s, paints were available in tubes. Once you have paints and tubes, you can take them anywhere. It was impossibly difficult if you still had them in those little pig's bladders that would break and paint would spill everywhere and dry out. They were a nightmare. That was for studio work only. But once you had it in tubes and you had someone providing small canvases, you could paint outside. But even faster, you could just take some of those pastels and work in them. So he did this one. This is, let's see, I'm going to tell you how big this is. Yeah, seven and a half inches by 10 inches. So this is the kind of quick sketch that he would take on site to take back to his studio. So this is that kind called us an etude. This was the traditional practice, although he wasn't trained the traditional way. Uh, you make your quick sketches, you catch the light conditions, you catch the relative tones, and then you take it in your studio and you work it up into a painting. So he took Monet under his wing. And there was this, well, earliest landscape known done by Monet. And I, I had shown that in the, the last series, but this was, Monet was 18 when he did this. Yeah, it's about, a foot and a half by two feet plus in scale. And it's quite a traditional conservative landscape painting. You could say that this is the theme of his life when you, when you um, think ahead to Giverny in the paintings of the water lilies his interest in reflections in water and sky and water and all the atmosphere in between is already stated here. But it's a very, very competent painting, very fine. So Monet with difficulty prevailed on his father to be allowed to go to Paris and study at the academy. <clears throat> his rich aunt paid for it because his father wouldn't give him money for it. But he didn't stay very long. He worked with an artist who was a finicky fellow, very made extraordinarily finished paintings. But in the, uh, he, his studio was cheap and he gave inexpensive instruction. And the great thing for Monet was there he met Renoir, who was the in from the country for the same reason. Basile, who had money, but was still going to medical school, but came here in his off hours and uh, several other of the art, and then soon Pizarro. So the group that become known as the Impressionists sort of come out of the, uh, rushing away from the studio of that one man. And um, so 
So Monet largely came back to work on the, at the coast and um, Basile came with him. Monet was extremely ambitious. Uh, not only was he willful and able to withstand the censure of his father, but <clears throat> he later on suffered from terrible poverty, but he never stops painting. Um, so this is an early landscape he did and, uh, sort of in the mode of Boudin. But now this is a, a larger one. This is, um, let's see, where did I put that here? Three by five feet almost. Because he submitted this to the Paris Salon and it was accepted and it was much admired. So what a marvelous start for a career. Uh, <clears throat> it's a painting that looks as if Monet were here, the water lapping around his feet in this chilly harbor with his wind-filled clouds and no sign of the kind of commercial boats that were true at this time or the housing coming up from Parisians coming to the coast. He, he makes it look quite uh, a scene of nostalgia and he, there's a sketch, a, a smaller painting of the same area, because you recognize this, that he did. This is in the National Gallery in, in, in London. And this one is, mm, yeah, a foot and a half by two feet. So this he may have done on the spot. So he's going to follow Boudin's practice that, that you make sketches on the site and then you convert it into a painting. But of course, how he converts it, this figure, these, and the wagon, they're all known in other works by Monet that he must have had sketches in his studio. And so he put them into the paintings where they seemed that they would fit. So this is not a scene exactly as he saw it. And why would he take one like this? Well, this, this is designed to appeal to the salon judges and to the salon attendees because it has drama, that lowering sky. Um, there is, uh, you can impute a, a sort of emotional quality to this painting. So this kind of... Um, the darkness, the brooding sky, the emotion, uh, people are going to stop to look. And he did a companion panel. Same way, in the studio. Now slightly clearing skies and a recognizable view, which we will do many times, but this too was done in the studio. Well, it's anything that's over three feet and five feet, you know, you, you're not, you're not going to do it uh, on, on the site. You, you have to be doing that in the studio. So with that great start, well, it's actually greater in a way because then there was a review in which someone misread the signature Monet had put on it and thought it was Monet. So uh, attributed the painting to Monet, which agitated Monet, but got these two artists to meet one another and um, then they become very good friends. But Monet sets himself up. I don't know if you say in competition with and the model of anyway, following what Monet did. So that Monet then says, okay, I have these two landscapes. Now I need to do a figure painting because thus the prize kind of subject in the academy, in the salon, is being able to handle the human figure. But, and this is now Monet's called Dejeuner sur l'air because it's a, like a reprise of Monet's from just two years before. One of the really significant differences is that Monet was going to do this of figures truly in the out of doors. He wants it in accurate light in an accurate setting. And he went down to Fontainebleau and spent the summer actually doing landscapes to find the right landscape background. So he wants to show how light really falls on the figures. And um, he has this 
Mm. They, well, I don't know. They were a couple then. His model, Camille, who he will ultimately marry. And his good friend, the painter, Basile, who came down and posed for the men. Monet sent a lot of letters nagging him, come down. I need you now. Come, come, come. You got to come. And Basile came down and posed. So he used several figures and he used them over and over again. But he wanted to make put it in an authentic setting. Because you know that's one thing that is so obviously inauthentic here. Well, he didn't get to finish that painting. Partly because he had no money and uh, the landlord took it as a surety. But he then did in the following year, do this one of um, just uh, women in a garden. He had the same woman, Camille, pose for, for every single one of them, the women here, and he got fashionable clothing for her to wear. Uh, the size of this one is hmm, almost, almost 10 feet high. Monet, late in his life, said that he had dug a trench in the ground so that he could paint this out of doors. But <clears throat> when this is clean, there's no evidence of any dirt or anything in there. That, that's, that's, um, that's Monet somewhat correcting, uh, aggrandizing his, uh, his own accomplishments. This had to have been done in the studio, too. Would the salon accept this? No. Nope. They said it was too unfinished. That common criticism that will be leveled at these artists. Well, he's not good. Monet always has many paintings going once. He, he wrote from this location, San Address on, on the coast where his aunt lived, it was right by La Havre. It's a much wealthier sort of little mm, vacation villa area. <clears throat> He's, I've got 20 paintings going at once, which he might well have done. But uh, this one in the map, um, it's the terrace, or later on he'll call it the garden, it's San Address. The, the town is Santa Dress. And this one in the map, um, this is 1867. And this is about, this is also a fairly big one. It's um, about four feet by three feet. So he has ambitions for this and he does sell this one. But this is a red, you know there's that blazing sun that's really crisp and the breeze is blowing. Look at those, you could hear those flags. You see all the steamers back here and the smoke, the relentless breeze on them. So you can feel it, you can feel the sun, you can smell the water. It has all this actuality and it is um, he must be on the upper level in his aunt's house looking out when he does this. And he has, this is his father, and he has other members of his family posing here for him. And yet there is something so unreal about this painting. And that's where we, I had stopped in the last series. And that is the absolute clear division of this into ribbons like not only is are you just straight face to face with the the fence here but you have that band to go across and this is a band of water that does not look like it goes anywhere down below this it just stops there because the marks in the water there and the marks in the water here of the wavelets are about the same size so it doesn't suggest recession until you get way back here. And then this is just as clear and just as bright at the horizon. So there's no atmospheric perspective. Monet is reacting, beginning to absorb Japanese art. 
another print by the same great print master of the 19th century, Hiroshige, where you could see distant landscapes clearly demarcated, band, 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 band in the sky. So he's working that into Western art. And what makes it even more um, formal like that, all those horizontals, but then you have on either side these flagpoles. Um, this is a kind of something that's been um, more recent art critics talk about than ones of um, when fr first impressionism was, was being savored by the public. They're saying, look how you can think of this as a precursor of the 20th century in art, where the emphasis is on the canvas as a flat surface on which you put colors in a design rather than as being a representation of something in the visible world. So it's so clearly that you have this aligned with the edges of the painting, so rectangular. But at the same time, same year, 1867, uh, let me check, I think, Am I wrong? I think that's the year when he, he and Camille, their son was born, 1867. Maybe I'm a year ahead of it. But anyway, he has a great burst of enthusiastic work. Uh, and this is one of the works he did. Um, this is the regatta at Santa Dress. So now he's just gone down along the shoreline. And you see the well-dressed bourgeois visitors who come down to watch it. And you can see the waves coming in. You can see through the water. You see how clear it is. You can see right down through here. A few streaky clouds and these scudding across the sky. And individual brushstrokes. This one's at the map. And it's, um, again, about not quite three feet um, by almost four feet. And this one's called the beach at Santa Address. It's roughly the same area. But whereas this is, of course, the life of the people of leisure and a sunny sky, now you have overcast and fishermen and other workers. And it seems he intended these as a pendant. This does look like it's done on the scene, doesn't it? Let's look at that brushwork there. That could be just quickly flecked in. However, technical analysis. He started painting it outdoors again as a scene with um, pleasure seekers and a regatta. And then he painted over it to turn it into the scene of workers. Um, so that he did in the studio. These are still studio works, ultimately in the studio. So he hasn't changed, much as his brushwork is changing, that idea that this quick brushwork is so that you can capture what you see just as it's right in front of you. Um, it's not in front of him when he's painting it. The same year he goes back to Paris and for the first time begins to paint some Parisian scenes. This is called the garden of the princess or of the infanta. Where he's painting this, he is in the Louvre. He, he and Renoir got permission to paint there. Um, to, um, well, was remarked upon by Others of their time, like Fantin Latour was the man who especially um, facilitated the um, visits to the Louvre by, say, Manet, Thomas Eakins, all visitors, all young French artists, so they can copy and learn. Um, they, they come on days when they can work at the Louvre. They can learn what the old masters did. They can study the techniques. They can make copies to learn by doing copies. 
Monet, when he gets there, um, Monet, excuse me, when Monet gets there, he looks at only at the landscape paintings, nothing else. And he gets permission to uh, look out the window or be in the outside colonnade and paint the land outside. He's not interested in the art of the past. It's the city of now. And so, especially in this, this is 1867, Paris is just um, bustling because they're going to have an, the international you know, World's Fair that, that year there. So this again has this kind of, um, it's unusual to have this uh, views, uh, such a steep downward view and such an oblique view of the gardens. It's not that this is the only place that he could have stood in the, around the Louvre colonnade. But that was typical in various examples of Japanese art. And he did this one too, that same year in 1867. And it's, it's just a, a, view, a view along the Seine. What's that? Ordinary life going on along here. It's rather interesting to see, this is partly a uh, result of this image, but the edges are not crisp, partly because there's this uh, rough weave that he's using underneath and the paint isn't sinking down into it. But also there are some early photographs that especially of people who are moving that they had that blurred edge. So it can also be reflecting how contemporary photography sees the world. Then um, in 1869, that was a really rough year for Monet. His son had been born, he had, had not yet married. And as a result, his father had to cut all income for him. So he's relying on the kindness of his friends and some money from his aunt to keep him going. But they're living in a cold water flat and they don't have enough money to eat. It's tough. But uh, it doesn't stop him. So he and Renoir uh, make a couple of um, expeditions to um, a leisure spot on the Seine just outside Paris. Very easy for everyone to reach. Um, called La Grenouille. Uh, I'm terrible with my French pronunciation. It's in English. It's called the Frog Pond. It, it was a. This is a photograph of the site where there was um, boating and there were uh, there was a place where you could eat and there was some swimming available here. So it was it was a, just a, a great, slightly seedy. Um, place to spend, spend especially a summer afternoon or a Sunday afternoon. <clears throat> and he and Renoir, Renoir decided, both of them, that they want to do a painting of this scene because that's showing contemporary life. This is the one by Monet that's in the mat. He wrote back saying, oh, I'm just doing some bunch of really rough, terrible sketches. And they were sketches because both men, both Renoir and he thought, I'm going to work this up and I'm going to make a painting for the salon, which they never did. And we only have these sketches, but he's getting closer to what we think of as real impressionism because this is done all out of doors. He's there on the side. And he is just recording what he sees, the colors that he sees, um, the he loves water always, the reflections in the water. A very cursory treatment of figures. This is a little blurrier here because that's to show the trees. You don't get to see individual leaves. It's largely the sparkle on the water. A few swimmers. These are almost caricatured. These two ladies in their bathing costume. So he's now not trying to... Um, 
edit at all. He's just, and this is that, um, as I see, this is what I see, and this is how I see it. Well, he did another one here. Now these colors are extremely bright, these new synthetic colors. And Monet would say, I paint what I see. Uh, it probably did have a very, very acute color sensitivities, but there was also an increasing interest in the science of color and the vision of color. So the um, complementary colors, um, the relations of colors to one another, um, how having red next to green makes each along the edge, both the red and the green brighter, white next to black, the white gets whiter and the black gets blacker. So um, they do have that knowledge, but also he said, if I see the color, I put down the color the way I see it. I do encourage you to go look outside carefully and you do find more colors than you expect. Or there's a real close up. And then this is one done by Renoir. Now, one thing, the difference in the temperament of the two men is, is, is evident because this little round place, which they, they call the Camembert because it's a little, this little round island. You see, especially this one, Monet is not interested in the human actors. They're there, they have to be there, and they're in the mid, sort of the mid space. Renoir is, so they come, he, he takes you much closer and you see individuals splashing around in the water here. And his stroke is more detailed and more feathery. You like this little pooch lying down here uh, and also more feathery there. And the range of colors he sees is different. So these men work side by side and they, you know, they could learn from each other when they were doing it. There you go, closer yet. So this is the Renoir. And here's another one by Renoir. He did more that have been lost. But this is just on the verge of Impressionism. Ah, this is another Renoir. All there. Someone they had in mind doing that, maybe working that up for, if not for the salon, at least for someone who would be willing to buy it, spend considerable money. Uh, and then he made another painting Another figure painting that you might think of as uh, sort of his uh, last attempt at breaking the barriers in a traditional way. This is, is, is called the luncheon. Sometimes you even see it called the breakfast. <clears throat> and uh, it's, where did I put this in? Well, it's, it's from 1869, he was working on it. And it's uh, over seven feet high. It's a technical interest that's interesting about this because when you look at the painting, it's like, uh, I, I don't know about you, but I really dislike this. It looks intentionally um, clumsy with a pitched perspective. Uh, when I worked on the canvas itself, revising and revising and having, now that it's been examined, they know this is his, his um, this is Camille and his son, Sean, who he delighted in immensely. Uh, originally she was shown with him on her lap and this visitor was looking out the window and there was no maid here and what was on the table has changed. And he changed this this way, and then he changed this this way, and then he tried something else. He's revising and revising and revising. If he had, uh, and then he submitted this to the salon. 
which rejected it. So this he did then show in the first Impressionist show. Uh, <clears throat> but this would have been the first scene in the salon of just an ordinary middle-class life, the life of the artist as he's um, living it, um, middle-class Parisian life. So he was also trying something different in subject matter, but didn't get him anywhere. So the next event, which does get him somewhere, was the catastrophe of the Fran Franco-Prussian War in 1870. Now, Monet had served a year in the military when he was young. Um, he served with a, a unit in um, North Africa and he got, became very ill. So he was mustered out and he, and he came home and his, his father paid someone else to fill out the rest of his years of, of duty. Well, when the Franco-Prussian War uh, broke out, rather than being conscripted again, Monet took his wife and son and moved to London. Um, as did another artist, but he was English-born, Alfred Seasley, but he was another one of their group. And then Pizarro would do that too. So when he came to London, he said he loved London. Well, you know, he will come back and paint seen some London later in his life several times. What he loved about London was the fog. So the light conditions. And he, he initially did the sort of the same sorts of subjects that he was doing in, in La Havre, um, such as, as this one here, which is, is just called the Thames below um, Westminster. Because here you see the Houses of Parliament. This was all brand new architecture at the time. Uh, the London Bridge had just been remodeled. There was a hospital that was just going up over here. And this was, I think, if I remember, this was finished in the 1830s. But he's, he's exaggerated the size of the tower here. But um, so he's, he's working in the way just as he was at, at um, the Frog Pond in this new abbreviated strokes of color. Um, this with a kind of firm structuring as he had in the terrace at Santa Dress. And, and the scene of life as is lived right now with workers working on the pile right there. Or another one he did there. Um, the, this is called the Pool of London. This is a customs house over here. So what was so great for him to go here, other than that he liked this new study of light conditions? It was there he met the dealer Durand Ruel, because um, an artist whom Monet knew, who was actually the first artist to have one of those uh, boats set up so that you could go um, take and have a floating studio, um, a man named Daubigny had also come to Paris. I mean, come to London. And Daubigny met Durand Rillo, who the dealer had decided to set up a business in London during the Franco-Prussian War, couldn't make any money while he was in starving Paris. And Daubigny introduced Monet to him, and then Monet introduced Cecily to him, and Durand Ruel began to buy Monet paintings. They weren't selling yet, Durand Ruel, with his business acumen, was willing to buy the art saying, in time, if I hold on to this, people are going to want it. And of course, ultimately they did. And when, after the war, they came back to Paris, I think uh, Durand Ruel bought out everything Monet had in his studio. Another advantage to Monet being there was that he saw works by Turner with that interest in light and color and reflective atmospheres and sketchy landscapes. These are both by Turner. And Constable, who worked with 
you know, famous Constable Skies. So he saw among the, these English artists, other sources of inspiration for his absorption in landscapes. This is maybe, I'm jumping ahead by two years for a reason here. Uh, <clears throat> so we, we come back to the, the work that named the movement, the impre uh, sunrise, impression sunrise that was in the first Impressionist exhibition. It's of the harbor at Le Havre, and it's from 1872. And I brought it in because there's something more about Impressionism I want to say. And another something about how there is more complexity in these sometimes than is immediately to be suspected. Uh, first of all, the title of the painting was maybe provided by Renoir's brother, because um, or maybe by Monet, but it was a last minute decision. The interest was in the foggy, misty, industrial landscape, this watery industry, um, just as he had been doing in London. And one reason for the extremely quick working as these scrubbing strokes here uh, goes back to something prescribed for anyone doing an impression, I mean, years before Monet came out on the scene, saying, if you're doing a sunrise or a sunset, you have to do that in half the time you would do any other impression because the sun isn't, you know, the condition of the light changes so rapidly. So he's especially loosely working for this. And it's very likely that he was also thinking of the tradition. Now here's one of those seascapes, not landscapes, he could have seen in the Louvre. This is by Claude Lorraine in the 17th century one of the most famous of the French landscape artists who did several of the setting sun in different scenes. So that's a local precedent among the greatest artists of the past. And Turner had done the fighting temeraire, this, which he saw in London, this great warship, which in the beginning of the 19th century was gonna be um, towed off and, broken up for scrap. And with the setting scene, and look at that, the yellow, the orange, the blue. The yellow, the orange, the blue. So it is possible this was meant to be a sunset. And it's very clear that he painted it quickly because all the oranges are up here. And it stops and he's picked up the blues and he works in the blues. Ultimately, he'll come back when the blues are dry and they're very thin here. So it won't take that so long to dry. And he'll put on the orange globule there of the sun. Then he works in the blues and then he comes down here. Only when you get down here, does he begin to put in some greens? And in a second working, he can come back and put this in, this in, and these in. So you can follow, this is a painting done in two working sessions. And you can take it stroke by stroke. To go, moving that way. So these paintings are simultaneously very objective because this is, the light condition in the certain atmospheric conditions at a certain time of day in a certain location, which you could go and verify for yourself the location. <clears throat> and also very subjective because it is in the colors as seen by one person and then put down with a stroke made by the wrist and the hand and the brushes of one artist. So. It, it's both simultaneously, and it's also simultaneously a landscape of a distant view and something flat on the surface where you're looking at each individual stroke. That was that 
tension that bewildered many artists. Well, that's the, uh, obviously we do Monet again next time. And um, is there anyone who wants to go back and look at anything or has a question about any of this before I stop sharing? Maggie. Yes. Mm. Thank you. Because I just hate this when it's like <laughs> woman in, <laughs> like no, into the void. What? The woman that was um looking in the mirror, I think it was a Renoir, but I'm not sure. No, 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 a woman named Morris M O R I S O T. Oh right. Okay. Yeah, or so. Well, I don't know if it was in this session, but the last before we got to this. You were talking about, you know, what was real and what was not real. But in that picture, yeah, you said she's looking in the mirror, but she's not looking in the mirror. Her head is facing down. Well, let's get this. Um, Sorry, was she just looking there. at that? You see, what it is, is that this view of the face is different than this view. Here you see her eye. Like here, it's as if she's, you know, she was changing, as I said, she was changing this as she went along. Like that arm changed and she slightly changed for the face. So it's like she turned around almost. Yeah. Here you have her profile in there in three quarters view. Oh, I so enjoy it when you look at these things this closely. Uh, does anyone had the conversation about you know they're not looking at you know they're not looking in the mirror. This was a, about I think it might have been the last session or maybe it was a, in the in the winter when we were talking right, about right, with Monet. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. Well, this was you know this is a, the cliche of a women's life. Self-reflecting is what they can do. Any others? All right, well. Oh, I think this is great. Just look at that light that's coming in through there that just catches right along here. Maggie, can I ask a question? Please do. Um, first seven. of all, first of all, thank you. Mm -hmm. Second, I've always wondered, you know, so some of the Japanese artists inspired, you know, some of the Impressionists, you know, you've mm -hmm. talked a little bit about that. Were the Japanese aware of this effect? I don't know. Because sometimes those wood block prints came in that there was actually, they were on paper that was wrapped around things that were. Right, because they were just you know, kind of, uh, they, they weren't high art at the time. No, 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 no. They were considered consumer art. Right. Um, I don't know. Hmm. I've always wondered that. Yeah. I mean, I'd have to look up when he or she gave, died and, you know. And, and it, it, it was in the, right in the middle of the century. Right in the middle. So would he have... So I don't even know what he is an artist. I don't think he would have known about this at all because this stuff, there wood blocks done mass mass printings. But maybe the producers of the wood, you know, but but so maybe not him personally as an artist, but but the industry or the the powers that be in that quote unquote industry. I wonder if they knew. I don't know. This I just think it's interesting, interesting. to. to so You're right, right. Because all I know is in 1861, there was a woman in Paris who opened up a shop that sold the prints. So okay, get get through yeah. that. Maybe we could find out, but I don't know. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Well, when, when you find out, please tell me. Well, <laughs> I've actually you can, looked because once you know, a while. You can, you can find, a, say, an Indian art and all, all other Asian arts. You can see their their response to Western art all the time. With you know, with the 
with the perspective and the theater or, or the figures or something will yeah. creep in but but you don't see that and certainly in the here she goes do you huh. good thank you sorry <laughs> oh no that's wonderful anyone else no nope? all right well thank you Mary. next week goodbye